A year after the largest protests in decades in Cuba shook the island's Communist Party government, little has changed. Protesters filled the streets, then expressing their frustration with food, medicine and gas shortages. The economic and political factors that caused the unrest largely remain today, with massive gas shortages forcing people to wait for days to fill their tanks, and hundreds of people who participated in the protests still imprisoned. Cuba is on USERF's special watch list as religious freedom remains highly restricted. According to its annual report, the government continues to use surveillance, harassment and ad hoc interpretations of legislation to suppress religious freedom and persecute advocates of religious liberty. We're fortunate to have Jason Poblete joining us. He's an expert on conditions in Cuba. Jason is the president of the Global Liberty Alliance and practices international and domestic law. He has helped free unlawfully detained Americans in several countries around the world. Jason, it's so great to have you here with us. Thank you for talking to us about this very special island nation. What is the history of religious freedom in Cuba? What can you do there as a church? Well, thanks, Monsa, for doing the special. It's just been phenomenal. And in Cuba, just 90 miles away, I mean, persecution, religious freedom is, is a myth in Cuba. It's mm. elusive. It has been since 1959. And the Communist Party in Cuba that controls pretty much all of civil society, once you step out of line, especially if you're a person of faith, uh, you're bringing yourself in within the eyes of the Communist Party, and that's problematic. So since 1959 and the 60s, and today it's been institutionalized, it's, it's systemic, the persecution in Cuba. So I think it's something that we, we, we see on TV sometimes, these images of freedom and, and religious leaders maybe speaking with government officials, but that's, that's a myth. A uh, reli there is no religious freedom in Cuba, and it's, it's under the control of the Communist Party, and there's a special office. We call it the Stasi, the, East, the Cuban version of the East German Stasi, the religion police, that frankly we've been advocating for sanctioning for several years now. We hope that this administration will do it. The prior one didn't do it, although we made some strides. I think. You need to rein that in, especially in the Western Hemisphere, because it's not just Cuba. That type of political persecution and religious persecution has spread to other countries with the help of Cuba, in Nicaragua, in Venezuela, and in other countries where they, even in the democratic nations, the attack on the church is ongoing, and it's happening throughout the Americas. And Cuba is right at the heart of it. Freedom of religion is illusory in Cuba. They're trying to squeeze it out of society. And the Catholic Church, by the way, is the only thing standing. So Pope John Paul started this process in 1998. Mm -hmm. He spoke about freedom in just about every single stop he made on the island. That, that spirit is still alive in Cuba, but they are coming under a lot of assault, especially after these uprisings uh, last year. So it, it, we're seeing priests attack, which, which hadn't happened in a few years directly. Now it's happening directly. John Paul II played a really pivotal role in kind of mm. reopening religious practice on the mm. island. Where people mo don't realize mm. that for many, many years, mm. decades, Christmas couldn't be right. celebrated. Public celebrations right. of Christmas were not allowed in Cuba. And, and when John Paul II, now a saint, went there, he transformed things. But as much as they've changed, they've also, like you said, stayed the same. Different administrations have taken different approaches. Mm -hmm. um, the Obama administration allowed people to go in um, through religious visas. Right. The Trump administration changed the rules a little bit, and then the Biden administration just opened up for families to be able to send money again, mm -hmm. um, saying that that money will never go to anti-democracy actors, which I find suspicious and hard to control. D does that actually have an impact on the people on the island? That's a a touchy subject in the diaspora community, for example, with Cuban exiles, and, and there's a lot of division within the communities about right. how to handle that. Because on the one hand, you want to, you know, how can you turn your back on a loved one? That's right. There's a lot of hunger, a lot of suffering in Cuba. On the other hand, it's a pipeline that's also been used by the regime to prop up an economy that's roughly between six to eight billion dollars a year that flows from here to there. The law is designed a certain way, our laws. It's designed to do both. However, through decades of either political maneuvering on the good of the, depending on the side, let's leave politics out of it, we've allowed it to become, uh, it's been abused by the system in Cuba. Right. And now these billions go in for things other than humanitarian relief. On top of that, this administration has allowed the Cuban regime to control how some of the humanitarian aid is distributed. That's what we are opposed to. No matter who's a Republican or Democrat, it doesn't matter to us. This has to go directly to the people. Right. And that's not what, that is not what's happening. So the Catholic Church in Cuba has played a constructive role in that as best they can uh, to at least separate 
the politics okay. from the aid. The but aid flow through the church. They're, they're trying, uh, but it's not easy. And, 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 and it takes a lot of patience to do anything in Cuba, just to get a pallet of food in Cuba, a pallet, you know, pallet, a, 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 just a crate, not, right. n not a container, just no, a pallet. No, no. Yeah. It's controlled. Standing and in line to get milk is a, is a regular thing for many people. Talk to me very quickly about political prisoners. Yes. A lot of people think that the illusion of that, that that has gone away, that people aren't arrested anymore, that we don't have these conversations about political prisoners in Cuba, but the regime still has and continues to imprison people. That's been happening since 1959, and it's not going to stop. So July 11th, you know, the, the latest uprisings last year, you know, a, I call it, unfortunately, a new generation of civil society activists and political prisoners because it's gone in waves now. Some of the older generations passing, but now there's a new generation that's never been exposed to this. Right. Some of these people are Catholics, practicing Catholics, some of them. Some of them have no religious background. But what's unique about this is that they're learning kind of through the hard, the school of hard knocks, right? They're in there receiving the blows psychologically and physically and are being locked up for it. And there's reawakening about, wait a minute, what's all this about? What's, why is this happening? So it, it's, it's been happening since 59. It's systemic. As far as the church goes, the Office of Religious Affairs with the intelligence services is in charge of going after the Christians, and that's, that's what they do. And in a more, it's kind of almost ghoulish. They're, 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 the party is now taking social issues, social issues that they know divide Christians, and like abortion, like LGBT issues, and using it as a wedge issue. Mm -hmm. They don't to create care. Division. Yeah. So in other words, they're dehumanizing a group of people to create division within the religious community. Because that's what they're doing. They claim to be supporting the rights of minorities. No, they're using that. And they're creating new political prisoners. And in unfortunate, I think it's gonna continue. There'll be more spikes. And I believe in more political prisoners. And the only way out of this, Monse, I believe, is to uh, tighten a little bit and enforce US law the way Congress intended and work with our Christian and other communities, faith communities out there to make sure that we're getting help to the people but not to the regime. That, I think, is a key part of what's missing right now in, in, I, our, in our policy. I think that's been the theme throughout all of the advocates that we've spoken to in, in the international space for this special discussing Christian persecution is tightening what it is that we do when we engage in the international space. Thank you so much, Jason. In honor of all those Christians who've been persecuted or killed for the faith, we ask that you pray the prayer for persecuted Christians. Look out for links to the prayer on our social media channels and be sure to follow us and take a moment to remember those who don't enjoy the freedoms we cherish here in the U.S.